Hey guys, welcome back to our study of the Industrial Revolution. We are now up to the topic of changing values and reform movements. So now we're going to continue our look at how the Industrial Revolution helped change um, society and how people acted and, and lived. So let's get into some of the reform movements of this time period and um, we're going to begin by looking at uh, something called etiquette. So etiquette, guys, if you're not sure what that word refers to, etiquette is simply kind of like the, the social norms and the behaviors you're expected to follow in a given setting. And the upper class and middle class during the Industrial Revolution, Revolution lived uh, a very strict life according to those rules of etiquette. In other words, there were things that they really were supposed to do, it was expected of them, and if they broke those rules of etiquette, uh, they would be shunned, um, that their life would be uh, you know, not as complete, they wouldn't be invited to the parties, and they wouldn't have as many friends, and they wouldn't have as many opportunities in life. Um, and there are all kinds of rules, um, you know, how you were supposed to dress, how you're supposed to interact with different people, different stations of life, um, even so far as to how you're supposed to write a letter. I mean, you name it, there was a rule um, that governed how you lived. And uh, here's a couple of examples. So, so in terms of etiquette, uh, every occasion had a different form of dress. And if you dressed, you know, outside that expectation, people would certainly look at you, talk about you. Um, you could just find yourself kind of on the outs of society. There are all kinds of rules on how to give a dinner party, how to pay the social calls. You know, there was what do you say in those situations. Um, there was just all kinds of rules uh, governing people's lives, even so far as the length of time you were expected to mourn for a dead relative. And by mourning, you would have to wear uh, the color black. And this wasn't just like a week or something. Uh, depending on what relative it is, it could be upwards of a year that you were expected to wear black as a sign of mourning. And if you didn't, people would you know, say, well, gosh, they must not have loved their you know, fill-in-the-blank relative that died. So that sounds uh, pretty pretty strict from our modern sensibilities. I think most of us live a much looser life where we're not so confined by having to say the exact right thing and wear the right clothing and have the right friends and all that. We, our life is a little bit more uh, laid back than these people from the Industrial Revolution. Now let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, gender roles um, and talk about what made a typical family from this time period. And if we look at this picture, um, we can tell that this couple is well off. And the reason we know that is not just the clothing that they're wearing, it's the fact that they're being photographed. Uh, you know, remember, photography is in its infancy early in the Industrial Revolution. It was not something that commoners would have had time and money uh, to sit for a photograph. So let's look at the two sides of the coin here. On one side, of course, is what men were expected to do. To do. Um, given the gender roles of the time. And the man is expected to go out and work, um, whether that's at a factory or in an office or on the farm or whatever. Uh, his job was the provider for the family. He provided the money and the clothes and everything that goes with that for the family. He really was the face of the family to the outside world. So any type of negotiation between the family and other uh, entities, whether it's businesses or government or whatever, uh, the man really uh, held all the cards. Um, he was the only one who had property rights in the family. Now, on the other side of the coin would be women, of course. And what were the expectations and roles for women? Well, women were expected to, of course, get married. Um, they stay at home. They're not working outside the home. Uh, they're raising the kids and they're providing moral guidance. In other words, they are the ones that sort of civilize the family, who raise the family in a loving nature, make sure the kids are taught well, um, raised with the right, the right values uh, and guidance. And the name for all of these things is called the cult of domesticity. So the cult of domesticity refers to the, the gender roles women were expected to follow uh, during this time period. Again, we're talking uh, mainly the 1800s with this cult of domesticity. Now, with this... Um, with these rather strict, so with this rather strict social structure, I think we can think of a particular social class that would have had trouble fitting into that, and that, of course, would be working class or lower class women. Um, they do have to work outside the home, most of them, because their family requires pretty much everyone to work, 
And so there's a very different life for your middle class, upper class woman and your working class woman. Um, they, they simply, um, they don't have the same expectations and, and really the same opportunities in life. All right, let's move on and talk about another big reform movement. Um, this would be the abolition movement. And this is something that um, had had certainly been a long time coming. Uh, Thomas Jefferson famously wrote in our Declaration of, of Independence that all men are created equal. And uh, the great irony in all that, of course, is that Thomas Jefferson himself owned slaves. So it's a reminder that the people in power often... Um, they had kind of a different view of what liberty looked like for everybody. Um, there was certain rights and certain privileges given only to certain groups. So let's look at what motivated our abolitionists in the 1800s. Some of them, of course, were motivated, motivated by morals, the sense that slavery is a sin, it's awful, it's horrible, it's inhumane, and therefore we should get rid of it. Others, however, saw slavery not as a moral issue, but an economic issue. Uh, slavery simply doesn't make a lot of economic sense. And I'll give you, I'll give an example of what I'm talking about. So think about your factory owners. They pay their workers a wage, but that's it. That's it. That's, that's where the responsibility ends. Whereas a person who enslaves people, they have to provide um, clothing. They have to provide shelter, food for the enslaved people. They have to also um, you know, see after their welfare in the sense that if the slave is sick or injured, they can't work, so you have to get them cared for. And so there's so much more resources going into the slavery system that just doesn't make that much money. So again, some people saw slavery as a moral evil. That's why they wanted to get rid of it. Others saw it as a waste of money. Then, of course, you have other people who see it both ways, that this is both wrong and inefficient. And a particular name we need to point out as a person fighting against slavery was a guy named William Wilberforce. Uh, William Wilberforce was a British guy, very religious, and he saw slavery as a sin, a sin that had to be dealt with. And he's going to push uh, just continuously through his career to end the slave trade and ultimately slavery. And slavery was ended in Britain in 1833, uh, shortly after William Wilberforce's death. The United States would then follow suit in 1865 at, uh, at the very end of the Civil War with the 13th Amendment. And at the bottom we have uh, three famous American abolitionists, uh, William Lloyd Garrison in the center, Frederick Douglass on the right, and on the left, John Brown. All right, now let's look at women's rights and uh, see what kind of progress women were making in the 1800s. And, uh, of course, the one of the key issues was that women simply didn't have any political rights. They couldn't vote. They couldn't hold office. And until they had those things, um, the, the fight for women's rights really couldn't go very far. So in 1848, uh, a group of women and men met in a place called Seneca Falls, which is in New York State. And there they had this big meeting called the Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, they drew up this thing called the Declaration of Sentiments. Um, which basically was a uh, kind of a declaration of independence for women. Uh, they demanded the right to vote for women. And this this is something that a lot of men, and frankly even some women in 1848, looked at um, as if that was just uh, wild and crazy, the idea that women uh, voting, that was, that was seen as just um, almost uh, in incomprehensible. But as time rolls on, women do slowly but surely gain more rights. They're gaining things like property rights. So uh, before women had property rights, if they did in fact have a job or they brought some sort of property into the family as they got married, that property belonged to their husband. Um, I mean, technically speaking, women didn't even own the clothes on their back. It was uh, owned by their husband. And so property rights are, are key because that's what gives women independence. Um, they also begin to have access to education. Uh, more and more women are finding themselves uh, finishing school. Some of, them are even go some of them are even going to college. And even a few of them are going on to things like medical school. Uh, so there, there really are, we're starting to see some sort of cracks there in this facade that, uh, of women staying just in the home. So let's look at some of the arguments against women's suffrage. And a lot of the arguments for men was that if women got the right to vote, then they would give up on all their domestic 
responsibilities and then the men would have to take care of the kids the men would have to be the moral uh, guidance in life and the women would go off and get jobs and be independent and wouldn't need men any longer and so that really frustrated a lot of men all right so let's look at a little bit of progress here so slowly but surely women do gain the right to vote across the western world uh, first, in uh, a good example, this would be the state of Wyoming, or actually the territory of Wyoming. Uh, they had the very first uh, female governor in 1869. Uh, the country of New Zealand in 1893, and then Australia in 1902 gave women the right to vote. Uh, women in America would have to wait, at least in some states anyways, until the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. All right, labor reforms. Let's get into our next topic here. And now we're going to look at how um, laws were passed to address the issue of child labor and overwork. So in 1833 in Britain, they passed something called the Factory Act, which limited child labor to only uh, children uh, nine and, uh, and over. Then the Ten Hours Act of 1847 did basically what it sounds like. It's going to limit the working hours for women and children to only 10 hours a day. Now I say only 10 hours, that's still an incredibly long day in the modern perspective, especially for kids. But this is a step forward. All right, our final topic, guys, is going to be the issue of education. So let's what's happening in education in the 1800s? And uh, you know, schools clearly back then were very different than today. Uh, not just in the fact that they looked different. Um, it was also the, the school year itself tended to be uh, shorter back then. It tended to be a little more sporadic. There would be breaks for things like planting and harvesting. And, and such like that. Um, it was a lot more informal. Um, students kind of came and went uh, throughout the school year. It was just very, very different from the modern day. Um, but this idea that all children should be going to school and to free public schools and making that attendance mandatory is in some ways the brainchild of a guy named Horace Mann. So Horace Mann was in charge of the Massachusetts school system and he believed that the only way that America can, can really truly succeed and prosper is if all citizens have a chance to be educated. And if they don't, then our country really is limited and also in danger. So schools had to be free and they also had to be mandatory. And this is kind of a, one of those first steps of getting kids out of the factories and out of the mines and into the, into the classroom. However, having said all of that, the reality is a lot of working class children simply would go to school maybe in their elementary years, but then as they reached you know, 10, 11, 12, they would really start to kind of drift out. A lot of working class families simply couldn't afford to have older children in school all day. They had to be working to help the family. And so graduating high school is still a pretty rare thing uh, well into the 20th century here in America. All right, guys, that is our rather quick discussion over how society was changing. We looked at some reform movements like the abolition movement. We looked at gender roles and things like the cult of domesticity. We talked about how education was changing, um, certain laws uh, restricting child labor and such. So it really shows, I think, that this time period, 1800s, was a, a remarkable time of change and really the creation of the modern world as we know it today.